Numerous reports indicate that manufacturing has emerged as the favorite target of ransomware groups and hackers. In response, a new report from Industrial Media discusses the evolution of industrial cybersecurity, its current state, and the tactics hackers are using, including phishing schemes, malware, and ransomware attacks. It also details solutions in Army manufacturers with the knowledge and resources needed to win more fights on this highly complex and ultra-competitive battlefield. Download the industrial sector's new battlefield by going to manufacturing.net backslash cyber. Hi, I'm Jeff Ranke, Editorial Director of Manufacturing.net and Manufacturing Business Technology. Welcome to Security Breach. One of the mindsets shared by hackers and their corporate victims is the desire to put a successful bow on the calendar year. For you, this can mean hitting a collection of shipping dates, production quantities, or equipment implementations. What many are beginning to realize is that the Black Hat community has a number of year-end targets to hit as well. The focus on closing out orders, dealing with holiday-related slowdowns, and potentially fewer employees on the plant floor often leave doors open to hackers. It's no surprise that these dynamics often result in the last quarter of the year producing large spikes in ransomware, distributed denial of service, and credential harvesting attacks. Our guest today will offer some insight on these attacks and how some of his previous experiences have given him a unique take on the bad guy's tactics. We're also excited to announce that this episode is being sponsored by Palo Alto Networks. Protect your OT assets, networks, and remote operations with Zero Trust OT Security from Palo Alto Networks. It's powered by AI and machine learning while offering comprehensive visibility, Zero Trust security for all OT environments, and simplified operations. For more information on Zero Trust security for all OT environments and simplified operations, go to www.paloaltonetworks.com backslash network hyphen security. It's now my pleasure to welcome Matthew Wolf, Director of Cybersecurity Operations at Imperial, a leading provider of cybersecurity solutions. Matt, thanks so much for joining us today, and welcome to Security Breach. You know, we've, we've gotten to that time of year, the temperatures are dropping, so of course the hacking activity tends to rise at the same time. Maybe you can kind of give us a lay of the land from your perspective. We're used to seeing an increase in activity from the bad guys this time of year. Are you seeing that? Is that holding true? Or are there certain things going on in the industrial sector particularly that have caught your attention? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. And from my perspective, there are seasons where attacks climb and attacks drop, but at the same time, attacks are always occurring. So it's not like there's a season for break. Um, <laughs> but typically, though, in the, in the wintertime, we do see an uptick in, in aggressive activity. So, and I think as an industry as a whole, we can see an uptick in, in different things going on, um, picking up right after summertime. And, and I have uh, my, my theories view, you know, for why that is. And uh, yeah. Okay. So what are some of your theories here? What do you see going on? And I guess, are, are there any particular attacks maybe that you're seeing kind of on the rise right now or? Yeah, um, I think phishing attacks are going to constantly just keep skyrocketing. But um, some of my theories is in the summertime, a lot of people get breaks from their day in and day out. A lot of uh, whether it's kids trying to learn how to hack or it's like the college student that might be looking going rogue and and really trying to pick up on some aggressive skills. <laughs> um, th that's that's where. In my opinion, in the summertime, they're really gearing up, really starting to learn more things. And then right around August, September, they're going back to school. They don't like it. And so they are going to try to see if they can make money elsewhere, at, you know, going on the dark side of things. So that's probably one of my biggest theories of, of why okay. I think uh, attacks increase right after the summer. No, it makes sense. I mean, we've heard a lot of other things, too. I mean... Hackers are like anybody else. They like to take vacations in the summer. When it gets to the fall, winter part of the year, if, they've, if they are working for a bigger organization, they've got goals to hit, quotas to make, if you will, just like any salesperson or anyone who works on a budget. That's what I know a lot of people have talked about, too, in terms of the ramp up that seems to hit in sort of that last quarter of the year. So, Yeah, for sure. And I know that um, so I used to be part of a red team, and I got to do a lot of different exciting activities and it really was true that the summertime was meant for vacations because <laughs> some of the uh, other red team people that used to be black hat and then they switched to gray hat and switched to white hat, 
you know, they started having families and and that was a yeah. big reason of why they stopped going the dark route and yeah the the summer times was meant for vacations with their families so interesting yeah. they're hackers are people too i guess you know they are That's the takeaway yep exactly whether they're a young person or young adult or even um older i mean i've met a 67 year old hacker i mean it's just they're all all different ages and um there is there is something to say about the younger ones being able to adopt it a lot easier because there's not so much as a technology reach that their mind has to make but still they're yeah. they're there and anybody can do it well i want to talk i want you to talk a little bit about your background because it is very interesting in terms of where you come from and what you're doing now so maybe we can just set the table there maybe you can talk a little bit about your background in cybersecurity and, and sort of where you got your feet wet yeah for sure so i think i got my feet wet whenever I may have been 12 years old and I wanted to get on the internet and um, the company to get on the internet was difficult to work with. And so I may or may not have found a way on the internet. <laughs> and so, I mean, that was many, many years ago, like, I don't know, 20 something odd years ago. But uh, uh, then like, let's say around 17 or 18, I really started doing a vulnerability test and pen testing when it was even a thing and uh, even setting up different video game networks back then. And because uh, back then um, um, there was this huge push for video game tournaments, um, esports basically evolved out of it. And uh, but basically somebody could go to these esports and they hack the opposing team and DDoS them essentially and just bring down the team. Jeez cause them to lag and then the other team wins. So, you know, the, the purse of $50,000, you know, and, and so thing is, you know, for, for me, it's like, okay, I, I know how to do it. So then I know how to defend against it. Or at least that, that was my thought, sometimes successful, sometimes unsuccessful. And it just made me grow from there. And uh, I took a detour. I went to the army, became an infantryman for a little while. And then uh, went on a couple of tours. After that, I decided to, um, get into the oil field <laughs> and uh, did some wireline, you know, a little bit of electrical engineering type work. And wow. then uh, also um, in the oil field, there's a lot of attacks that occur. And so like my knowledge was also being picked apart in the, in the oil field to be able to help defend our, our gun trucks out there. And then also the headquarters. So it, it was just a really interesting string of events. And then eventually I got to work at a, a government entity and uh, doing just, you know, regular things. <laughs> Can't really yeah. speak too much on it, but uh, <laughs> um, essentially um, Impero said, Hey, we would like to bring you on. You have this diverse background and all these different sectors. And uh, I was like, sure, bring me on. And so I ended up at Impero, but throughout the whole course of things, I've done everything from, black hat to gray hat to white hack pin testing as well as on the uh, defensive side um, as well so i mean i have to ask <clears throat> when you're on the sort of coming from the dark side if you will um what what were some of the biggest things that you've been able to that you learned from that experience and have been able to apply now from the white hat side of things for sure um <clears throat> i would say the footprinting reconnaissance the the first step in the cyber kill chain which all new hackers all aspire to to learn from somewhere. So they typically will pick up, you know, EC Council's certified ethical hacker, which, yeah. you know, it's a it's a toss of a cert, you know, it's even though it's twelve hundred dollars, but the the footprinting reconnaissance phase, it was something that on the the dark side, going into the dark web, buying Intel on a target that I'm going to exploit. It was something that I think was extremely undervalued um, mm. from a defensive perspective. And so whenever I went to the defensive side, they're saying, hey, we need to make sure this organization is secure. I'm like, okay, well, let's see what's out there. And here we are going on to the dark web and pulling information from them. I'm like, oh, hey, by the way, I have all your admin passwords. And they're like, what? Wow. I'm like, it was already out there on the dark web. And so that's where even at like the stage one, step one of the cyber kill chain, going from the dark side to be able to go on the light side of knowing like, hey, I really need to 
yeah. to cover all my bases, even from a, an aggressor perspective. Yeah, I want to talk about that a little bit. I mean, the credential harvesting and then sales on the dark web, it's a huge issue for all for companies across the board, but especially within the industrial enterprise, that goes all the way back to Colonial Pipeline. Basically, that's how they were able to get in there with some old credentials. What were some of the things that were, I guess, maybe surprising to you in going through that process, whether it was just how easy it was, how much there was? What were some of the things you picked up there? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll probably caveat from that question a little bit, and I'll wrap it in at the end. Um, so right now, there's this huge push for MSPs to start securing organizations. And with those MSPs, they provide security for you know, credential harvesting or, you know, abuse internally, you know, they, they have these different things that they're able to provide, you know, phishing attack pr prevention, you know, with using certain phishing campaigns, but essentially trying to bring it all around um, in the dark side of the, the scheme. Like whenever I was looking at everything, I did not know that there were so many insider threats to organizations as there were, it's like almost like every organization had one person that either intentionally or unintentionally leaked information and data. And uh, whether it was like, oh, they clicked on this email and because they clicked on the email, then now that, you know, the person's emails just got dumped into the dark mm -hmm. web. Uh, take uh, DuPont, for example, uh, I feel bad for them. So my mom's an NASCAR fan, love Jeff Gordon. You know, DuPont's there. Well, I remember when they had their insider threat guy leak all that intel. And I think they ended up losing a couple hundred million dollars um, out of the deal. And that person was someone on the inside uh, intentionally leaking information, leaking data. So, yeah, that's where all that was occurring on the dark web. And that company didn't know about it. And that's where looking back now, if they had someone internally that knew, oh, I need to think like a hacker and not think like a defensive person, then they could have prevented it. But then again, nobody thought of that until after that happened with DuPont, hindsight sure. 2020. So anyway, to, to do a long roundabout on that answer, that's that's what I have to say about it. Yeah, it's, in, it's really crazy as far as the lack of appreciation for how much damage can be done with all of that information that's available out there from companies. And a lot of it comes from really inconspicuous communication, um, simple questions that may not mean anything, forms you're filling out that you think are coming from a vendor or not. And it, it all just they're all just big pieces of a puzzle that hackers are using to, uh, to infiltrate in any way they can. You mentioned phishing schemes. There's been a lot of other approaches too. Um, we're hearing more and more about even even and this is bringing up another topic here, kind of going all over the place. But even using AI now to harvest a lot of these credentials, I'm sure you're coming across AI a great deal. I mean, it's on everybody's buzzword list. What are some of your takeaways, or some of the things you're dealing with now in terms of artificial intelligence and its impact on cybersecurity for the good guys and the bad guys? I guess. For sure. I think AI is just going to continually to, to grow at an aggressive rate. I could predict, you know, saying like, oh, well, in five years, we're going to have very robust AI tools in order to exploit systems that don't have a compatible defense. But at the same time, you could say, well, in five years, we're going to have AI defensive tools that's going to be able to shut down any service. So that's where the industry is going to grow on both sides of the scheme. Like while we are going to have I mean, there's already chat GPT, how to hack videos that are out there. And then that's what these people are going to keep. Uh, these aggressors yeah. are going to keep learning and growing. But um, dealing with uh, machine learning and AI and my own entity, um, I mean, we we are pretty heavily looking into all the different capacities of machine learning, not, any, not only from a product perspective of what we can provide, but also defensive and um, yeah, defensive purposes. I was going to say offensive, but not offensive going externally, but offensive going internally. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's another thing is entities, sometimes they only have a defensive side and they don't have an internal, you know, red team themselves. So they have to rely on those third parties. So we're, we're looking at it from both sides of the perspective, but working with AI and machine learning, it is a very in-depth process. And uh, from a defensive perspective, you know, if you have, um, 
a vulnerability defense, let's say you have signature base, and then beyond signature base, you have heuristic base. Beyond heuristics, then you have anomalies. And you know, the, the list keeps growing of all these defensive depth. The thing is, is like, how do you teach a machine to learn the same thing, to go out and fetch more signatures, to go out and fetch more heuristic behavior, to go out and fetch more anomalies that other systems have seen. And that's where one of our things that we are looking at, we have a closed collaborative loop of um, different websites and different things that we see on all of our products. And we are able to consolidate that and, and really leverage it. But that was, 10, 15 years in development for us to, yeah. to really get it good. And that's where, I mean, AI, while it's going to pick up, the defense is really going to have to set up their game. Yeah. It, you know, it's interesting. Whenever I have these talk about these different technologies, whether it's AI, you know, we talked about some of the credential harvesting stuff and the things going on in the dark web. It always comes back to a human element as well. It always comes back to the people factor. I'd be interested to get your thoughts because now that's finally getting more attention, whether it's manufacturing or other industrial sectors as well, other industry sectors, talking about we need to keep our people trained up and aware and alert at the same time, not freaking them out to the point where they can't do their jobs productively. So maybe you could offer some thoughts there in terms of identifying and appreciating that human element, but also working with them to put systems in place that they'll actually use. Yeah, good question. Good, uh, good lead on that. So um, I think one of the things that I say more often than not is that technology can be a great tool, but a terrible master. And I think that's <laughs> going to go for yeah. just about anything because a, like let's say AI or whatever tool you're going to use, it's not going to be what saves you. It's actually going to be the people that are using it that's going to be able to protect you. And because uh, real real world scenario, um, I was called up to defend this certain network actively being exploited. I get on ground and they had this amazing firewall. I'm talking about 50 G's plus firewall. And uh, this this amazing, nice firewall was not really configured. I mean, basically it was configured like a router and uh, there was no controls, nothing on it. And literally it took me like 10 minutes to walk them through how to configure it. They put it up to their change management board, they approved of it and then they implemented it. And then basically the attack stopped within 10 minutes. And so that's where, again, like you can have all the tools in the world but unless you got the right people who know what they're doing, um, they're really not going to work for you. And how to recognize that? Um, I'm actually a huge proponent in experience over like certifications or degrees. Um, but having people with good active experience on a certain product in a certain defense stage is really what's going to help you to identify the right people. Because while I may have, you know, 20 years experience with configuring firewalls or actively using it, um, if a new firewall comes out, I don't have active experience on it, but yet it can still translate well for most of the time. And so that's where, yeah, if somebody's like, I need someone to help me with my external defense, that's how they're going to do it, is that they're going to find the person to fit the, the part. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting. That's like the perfect analogy for manufacturing right now. We've got all these tools and all this wonderful technology, Industry 4.0, IoT, whatever your terminology of choice is, we, we've got it all there. It's just understanding the right way to implement it. And I think it's really a positive thing for the industrial sector is size has become less of a factor in terms of the capability to implement a lot of these tools. I think we're seeing a, lot of, a little bit more evening of the playing field when it comes to access and ability to implement these things, which is positive. Now we just need that expertise you were talking about in terms of getting it in play, which is a huge challenge. And I don't care what size of enterprise you are right now, industrial sector or whatnot, that's hard. It's hard to find, especially operational technology security people. And in, in working with the industrial sector, Matt, have you seen anything that's been especially effective either in finding folks outside the organization, developing people internally, or, or whatever the case may be? What could you share there? Sure. Um, so I think on a, on a daily basis, I have to discuss and a certain topic. It's like, how much money is too much money to invest in security? <laughs> and yeah. I think I, I have this topic on a daily basis. And basically, you get what you invest in. Because 
uh, let's take this organization. They want to go out and they want to hire a team of people and they're going to spend a million dollars on this team of people. And then in a month, this team actually gets like every one of them gets picked by other other organizations to come work for them. Well, now they're just down a whole team and have to start up from scratch. And uh, whereas this other entity went out and bought an MSP, but yet the managed service provider didn't actually um, pull through and actually implement anything in that time. And so now they're out a million dollars. Well, those are two bad scenarios, but now let's flip it to where they're good. A company invests in, let's say a million dollars got and gets this amazing security team. And let's say they use all these open source tools that are available out there that were developed by amazing cybersecurity defense people. One of the open source tools is called Rock NSM. It's not very well known, but yet it is the number one stack used in defense for open source defense. But yet, so the security team now just saves you a million dollars. And then but I don't, and then from the MSPs, they not only delivered, but they actually provide even more value out of the security team. So that's where you can look at it from one side way or the other, but um, you're going to get what, what you're investing in. And um, but at the same time, I think every organization needs to size appropriately because, you know, if their IT guy comes up and says, we need a million dollars and they're like, but we only have 10 customers and we're only <laughs> profiting like $10,000. And it's like, okay, that's not right. But yet, <laughs> let's say like the IT lady comes up and she says, well, I think that we need this firewall to help us get through the next three years. And then at year three, our capital improvement plans needs to have this upgraded one to increase the bandwidth. Then, I mean, that's try, try not to get too deep into it, but having the capability of like seeing what you need in that right position to be able to grow further. I think those conversations is, is what needs to happen. Yeah. And with our customers and what we talk about on a, I think on a daily basis, I help them to really be able to see like what they have and what, what they could, could grow with. And I think that's a great point that you bring up there, especially having those conversations in the way, a different perspective of looking at it, not just now, but down the road. I think one of the challenges we've always had in manufacturing and throughout the industrial sector is this difficulty of we silo IT and OT, and they're kind of in different entities. We're getting better at having these folks talk to each other and share information, but it's still a challenge at a lot of organizations. Are you seeing that across the board and other people that you're working with, is that getting better or, or how, how do you see that dynamic, I guess, playing out and bringing together the operational and the IT folks? Yeah, to be honest with you, I, I don't think we're making progress like we should. And the reason why I say that, um, I actually tried researching it to see if I could find the news article um, from back in, I think around 2013, there were two Russian hacker teams that were mad at each other. And they both these teams were in different cities so they said okay well on this day starting at midnight we're gonna hack each other's city and the first one to take down the whole grid wins well 10 minutes after the turn of the day one of the cities got shut down for days and, and so that was in 2013. and so you want to take let's say 10 years ago these russian hackers and again it could have been any country but these hackers they want to do something malicious. They had the capability of shutting down a grid 10 years ago. They still have that same capability. It's not like, oh, we had a capability, but then it went away. So that's where looking at it today, this merge with OT and IT, there needs to be some really good, humble conversations on both sides. The IT people need to be humble enough to know, like, just because you think of this solution is going to be the right one, it may not be. And that's where the OT then needs to go out and either get an addition, like someone's additional opinion to be able to bring in and say, hey, well, we have this third party audit that says we actually don't need as much, but really we can lower our risk threshold by doing X, Y, and Z. And then, but vice versa, if you have a third party saying, well, we're you're not secure or you're not insecure at all, but yet the internal IT, the person is literally showing visible like stress and and almost a regret for coming in every day yeah. Th they need to listen to it and and in that whole battle 
of that conversation, I think both sides need to not only be humble, but also persistent in, in their approach and not give up because um, just because it's a no today doesn't mean it's going to be a no tomorrow and the next week. No, great thoughts there. Moving on a little bit, Matt, let's talk about, you know, we know Imperial recruited you out of doing some things that you can't tell us exactly what you were doing, but uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the company and some of the work that they're up to. For sure. So our company has several different products that we offer, everything from web filtering to remote connect to student well-being to um, vision, which helps us to see what's on different devices. So we get pretty granular on different devices, uh, whether it's just web filtering or it's all the way to controlling who can even access that device and control whether or not they can even right click on that device. And so we we get pretty, pretty granular, not only in just devices, but also um, equipment and IoT that you wouldn't think would need security to be integrated into it. So that's what uh, our company really gets involved in and we're across different markets with with our company and providing defense very interesting so i want to dive back a little bit into some of the things you were doing before in peril some of your background a little bit i know you said you did some work as a penetration tester and i'd be really interested to learn there again there we're looking at exploiting probably some very specific vulnerabilities or at least probing in some different areas of the operational landscape I was just, I just got to be, I'm just curious, you know, were there particular avenues that you saw as being successful more often than not? Or what was some of the big takeaways that you took from that experience? For sure. So, um, which let, I'll give you a list of a couple different situations <laughs> and I'll, I'll let you, uh, you pick which one you want me to talk about. All right. So from an external perspective of like, let's say gaining access into the network and then having fun from there, or, um, I would say my personal favorite, which is, uh, doing social engineering in person. And then uh, another perspective is after you've already uh, gained access to the place, be it VPN, that credentials that were just left open, or uh, you just happen to already be on the network, uh, like yeah. on the guest network. So which, which situation would you want me to dive into? Let's start with the social engineering because I mean, that's where it starts, right? That's the first, uh, the first access point. So let's start there, I guess. Oh yeah. So social engineering, that's probably one of my favorites, um, if not the favorite. So what I love doing is trying to charm my way in. And that means flirting. Oh, I'm going to flirt with everybody, anything. I'll flirt with a picture if it lets me in the door. And so that's okay. where I will, or I used to, I used to go into an organization and uh, definitely flirt my way in and, and, get access into the building and not only get access into the building, but get access into an office. You know, obviously the person's in the office with me, you know, and I'm, I'm asking, Oh yeah, what's your favorite, you know, drink? What, what kind of whiskey do you got? Do you got any here? You know, I get the person yeah. started then I get the, per try to get the person drunk while on the clock, you know, it's just so, so abusive. But the thing is, once I get the person at a certain level that they know that they messed up, even if it is a perspective, like, because whenever I walk in there, I'm like, hey, by the way, um, I'm not who I said I was. I am Matthew oh. Wolf. And they're like, wait a second. And then at that point, it's just so embarrassing. And then at that point, I have something on them. So that's where it's like, I don't have to stay, stay the actor the entire time. I just have to get something, get some sort of leverage. Yeah. And at that point, using that leverage into everything else. And uh, meanwhile, the whole way into that office, I'm dropping USB devices. I'm dropping pineapple sniffers. I'm dropping all these little artifacts all around the place to give me back doors everywhere. And so it's, yeah, probably one of my favorite things to do. Wow. It's crazy that that stuff is still works. I mean, we're 20 years after Stuxnet and the, dropping the USB devices is still effective. That's crazy. Uh, well, I mean, I have to follow up that a little bit because when we look at manufacturing, like accessing the VPN network and some of those other remote um, uh, channels is a huge concern, especially after COVID and folks working from home more. But the remote monitoring, just when you have more enterprises spread out over more geography, more data flowing in. So let's take it from that perspective. You've, you know, you've done all your social engineering and now you've got access to some of these networks. What were some of the things you try to exploit? Yeah, one of the biggest things was um, SCADA networks. 
I love getting in on a on a SCADA network and trying to really take down any ICS that I could. And so um, there was this uh, operation I was on and we were supposed to be, let's say, um, how do I word this? Um, <laughs> um, adjusting a water valve, I'll put it that way. And so um, there was a electronic control that, that uh, adjusts the way that water works. And so uh, basically, whenever we got a signal um, in, a, in a certain repetition, it would open up the valve. Whereas if you gave it in a different repetition, it, the valve would close. I'm like, OK, I could just set my ping rate to be at that certain thing. And it'll probably get the same pulse. And sure enough, I turn on the water. The problem was whenever I went to turn it off, you know, after I did the proof of concept, it wouldn't turn off. For whatever reason, the payload was too big. And then now I actually just bricked it open. So it was a pretty big water spill. Yeah. <laughs> and that's so crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where like I had access into the network and because they didn't have something as simple as an access control list to just block my communication to those ICS systems, I was able to do so much damage. And that's where even the simplest of tools going back to that, like if you just had this socket wrench for this half inch, it would have just turned easily. But instead, you're using a pair of pliers, and it's not really going to get you far. So, but again, that's where if they just had the right tool using the right the right socket size, it would have been yeah. just fine. And they didn't, and yeah. we had a very big water spill. That's great perspective. A conversation about cocktails can lead to basically, I mean, you could have done worse than that, gaining access to that particular ICS. I mean, you could have messed with chloride levels. You could have done a number of different things in accessing a water treatment facility or, or anything like that. That's that's incredible. But it also illustrates exactly the type of battles we're fighting every single day. Yeah. And well, for this one, it was actually uh, the sprinkler system. So basically <laughs> everyone got hosed in every <laughs> office in yeah. every area everything was hosed oh, and, man. So, and that's where because they didn't have yeah that segregation of of let's really break down the network of of how we operate and again the, the it team could have been saying this or the operation team could have been saying it why haven't you done this yet it could have been that but at the same time i feel bad for different organizations such as like mgm that that just had this data breach and stuff like that because you can have 99 problems and if you fix all of them, but left, but yet left one out, then it looks like you've done nothing, done nothing at all. And that's where I, I really feel for the organizations that get hit, that things happen and where it's just, it's such a, a forced humbling experience. And, and that's where like, if an organization can say, Hey, let's just go ahead and humble ourselves now and really like try to build up rather than get humbled. I think they're in a much better place. Interesting. Yeah. Incredible. You know, one of the things you mentioned before too, is sort of the transition you made from black to gray to white in terms of your, your role within cybersecurity. First of all, maybe you could talk a little bit about the mindset. How do people's perspectives shift in making that transition? And also where can other companies find these folks? Because they could be the ultimate solution for some of these challenges that we're talking about. Yep. Um, so whenever I was in the black hat days, I did not really have a moral scale. And so uh, moralism was just something that uh, the the weak people had is, is kind of like what my mindset was. And uh, basically, like I, I, for a lack of a better way to say, it, I came to Jesus and uh, was like, I don't need to do this anymore. I feel a little too guilty. And uh, I also joined the army and then I wanted to start a new path, new direction. I didn't want to go to jail, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> and I really tried to clean up my act. But uh, one of the things that I noticed was that whenever I was in the army and switched to cybersecurity, the amount of cybersecurity professionals that are working for the government, it it is outstanding. And um, the connections that you get to meet and the people that you get to know it's phenomenal. I mean, there's different events out there in the world, like such as Black Hat in Las Vegas that a lot of people go to and a lot of companies go to recruit out of Black Hat. And there's all, obviously like other uh, cybersecurity things. I can speak on Texas. There's a lot of different cybersecurity entities that they have so many professionals that collaborate within it. There's a really a healthy cell in Texas. Um, but even in Idaho, Idaho National Labs, I mean, that's a yeah. 
phenomenal place. I've met their team many times. I've done different exercises with their teams. It's phenomenal. Um, so I guess my short answer on that one is hire from the government. No. <laughs> <laughs> Find a cyber protection team in your area and, and recruit the people. They'll and pay them well. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're going to know folks too. It's like you mentioned, making those network connections. So it makes a lot of sense that way. So Matt, this has been awesome. A lot of great insight here. Maybe you can, we can wrap this up by just looking forward a little bit. What do you see on the horizon? What are maybe some of the bigger trends that we should be focused on looking into 2024? Yeah, awesome. And it's been a good experience for me too. I really appreciate being here. It's a good talk. So in 2024, I think in my perspective, I really think social engineering is going to keep on climbing. And, and here's my perspective on it. So we had COVID, a lot of crazy things happened. Everyone went remote and there was this huge social deprivation that, that occurred. And then now we're coming out of COVID a couple of years later, and now we're getting back into the normal stage of like, what is social interaction? Well, now everyone is mad at each other. And so now we're going to go back into looking for things elsewhere. So again, there's so much psychology when it comes to the hacking world that for me, I think social engineering is going to keep growing because I think people are going to start being susceptible to it again. Of, And I, I don't want to say like the Nigerian prince, his money is locked up, so I'm going to send him money. But I mean, there's, there's going to be healthy organizations that get exploited and that they're going to be used as a tool to get into other organizations. And that's where, that's where I see the uptick is coming is, is really in the social nearing aspect. And then after the social nearing aspect, again, that just gets you in the door to do actions on object objective. But after that, I think ransomware is going to be what's going to be detonated. Yeah. yeah. Which I've actually had experience doing and I've actually deployed ransomware, not, not on a, on a good person's network. <laughs> um, yeah. so, but I've actually deployed detonated ransomware just design my own ransomware so and it's it's easier to do than we realize no agree with you on both fronts i mean when you look at the social engineering perspective with how much more manufacturers are working with cloud applications and how again doing back to the social engineering it can be so easy to just garner bits and bits and pieces of information that can help them put together a profile to get access to some of those cloud apps. And that's how we've seen a lot of uh, systems get infiltrated. You talked about the DDoS, DDoS attacks. Those are rising. Ransomware is off the charts. It is. It continues to be a huge, huge issue. So, Because it's so easy. I mean, yeah. it's so easy to do. And that's why it's going to continue to be easy to do. So how much did you ask for with your ransom? <laughs> well, in this case, it wasn't as a uh, give me money. It was here's ransomware. You're shut oh. down and I'm not giving you the key. <laughs> yeah. So okay. and it was uh, set up on a worm. So if they brought on any new system, this worm would keep trying to get its way into any new system as well. And it got its way into the backups. Yeah. And that's the thing. Hackers will go for the throat every time. Like that's, yeah. There's not a chance that they wouldn't. They're getting more vindictive. And I mean, this ransomware topic is so interesting just because we hear so many different reports. I think at first people were paying the ransom to get back online. Then they started realizing, hey, just because I pay it doesn't mean I'm getting everything back. How do I deal with that whole dynamic? Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah, there is something that um, isn't exactly talked about as much as it should be. And uh, I'll give you some, some uh, secrets, I guess you could say. And uh, so... My company sent me out to the FBI headquarters out in uh, California and San Diego. And whenever I was there, I got to meet with the fusion, fusion cell that was there that makes, makes up different law enforcement agencies. Well, we have fusion cells all around the United States. These fusion cells are designed for a certain purpose, be it cybersecurity defense or be it defense against school shootings or defense against um, people trying to exploit ICS systems. The thing is, a lot of companies don't know that they can freely communicate with these fusion cells for free, as well as even get registered to be a collaborative person involved in these fusion cells and to receive collaborative help and uh, talks with these fusion cells. So I think that's one of the things that isn't talked about and isn't well known. 
Yeah. And uh, any basically any organization can basically call their FBI office and say, I want to get involved. I want to be part of this cyber defense collaboration. And uh, what do I got to do? How do I got to do it? Thanks, man. For more information on the work Impero does, you can check them out at imperosoftware.com. Thank you for joining us today. And to catch up on past episodes, you can go to manufacturing.net, ien.com, or mbtmag.com. You can also check Security Breach out wherever you get your podcasts, including Apple, Amazon, and Overcast. And if you have a cybersecurity story or topic that you'd like to have us explore in Security Breach, you can reach me at jeff at ien.com. For Matt Wolf, I'm Jeff Ranke, and this is Security Breach.